Welcome to another edition of Tuscaloosa Talks. I couldn't be more excited about being here at Crimson Village with my good friend who I knew way before I ever got elected to public office. And quite frankly, one of our local heroes during the last two years from COVID-19. Dr. Paramasetti, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, uh, Mayor. Now, I know you're a little bit nervous about this. We were just talking uh, before we got started because you're a guy that is driven by data. I mean, certainly that goes into your decision making. Um, what drove you to get into the medical profession? Mayor, uh, I was born in a, a family of physicians and uh, I was... Now, you, now, tell people where you're born. So I was born um, in India, um, mm -hmm. southern part of India. Um, for a middle-class family uh, where a few of uh, my family members are uh, physicians. And I grew up um, in an environment where uh, I have some influence watching them uh, as, as physicians. And then um, I lost my dad uh, when I was a fourth grader and uh, my mom uh, became a widower at age 28 and since then she's a widow. And uh, she used to tell us, uh, you know, I'm living for you guys and uh, I, I want you to uh, do well in life and make me proud mom. Um, and then she used to tell us, look at your uncle, look at your aunt or, you know, your family, they're all physicians, so you need to be like one among them. So that is another thing. So basically by growing in the physician type of uh, environment in the family, made me think that I need to be a physician, or a surgeon, or, and then my mom's, um, you know, I want to make her proud mom. I want to make her dreams come true. So these are all the main two things that really pushed me hard to, uh, to go into the medical field, Mayor. Well, you've made her proud, and, and you've made Tuscaloosa proud. Now, you mentioned being a surgeon. You're actually a surgeon by training. Yes. Now, uh, to tell people a little bit about that. So after undergrad in the medical school in the southern part of India, I uh, went to um, Jamaica and I was doing my surgical residency there for three years before I moved to U.S. in uh, 1992. So how'd you find your way to Tuscaloosa? So I moved to U.S. and got into residency in uh, Medical College of Wisconsin uh, in family medicine. And then I got married to Dr. Anne, uh, who has uh, a training in UK, London. She is basically a psychiatrist trained there. And then after our marriage, uh, she moved to US. Um, so in UAB, uh, in the psychiatric department, she got into a child psychiatry fellowship where she got a credit for her training in UK, which is very rare, mm -hmm. usually, the medical uh, professionals come to this country, they have to start all over again, regardless of what training you had, uh, what specialty you are, you have to start all over again. But uh, in her case, because of her training in UK, they said, you don't need to do the basic residency of psychiatry. We'll get you into a child psychiatry fellowship. So I was looking for, so basically we save, she saves three years of her training. Mm -hmm. She's always a psychiatrist in India and then came to UK and became again a psychiatrist. Again, you gotta start all over in the US. So it's gonna be three more years of wasting her time. So basically we can save three years of extra training. So I was looking for a, a job because I was just finishing up my residency. She's trying to look, looking for a residency. I'm finishing up mine. So I was looking for some place to work around Birmingham. So Birmingham, Tuscaloosa, I even looked at Utah, it was actually Sandra Hewlett, he was the medical director for West Alabama uh, Health Services in those days. Um, I initially uh, signed up with her to do primary care with the OB, and then um, I have other opportunity in Maud Watley Health Center. Um, uh, so I kind of have an offer in Maud Watley Health Services as a medical director. Uh, so I thought that's more challenging, uh, not only the physician plus administrative things. Uh, so somehow I choose to come to Tuscaloosa because of the job in Mount Watley Health Services. So my wife used to drive from here to um, uh, Birmingham for the residency. So that's how I ended up in 
Daskalos. And well, I hope you've felt the love of the last two years because um, most of us are not med medically trained, nor do we truly understand what happens, whether it's biology or immunology or, or whatever, as it, re as it relates to COVID-19. And so two years ago, COVID-19 strikes and people are looking for answers. Um, you became at the epicenter of it, you and quite frankly, the medical community here in Tuscaloosa. Um, but you were out front. Um, do you know how many tests that your clinic has done in nearly two years since COVID-19? Sure, yeah, we were actually just uh, looking at the data. Um, so surprisingly, uh, including um, the rapid tests and the PCR test, uh, we have performed over 70,000 uh, tests. Hold on a second, 70,000 tests. tests, my goodness. Tuscaloosa and West Alabama area. We have all our locations, um, seven days a week we were um, testing. Um, so that's an uh, amazing number. And then if you look at um, the vaccines, we have administered about uh, 4,000 doses of vaccine through our uh, clinics. And uh, we have been doing um, antibody infusions uh, also, uh, you know, since they are, you know, came to availability. Yeah. So about 2,500 uh, antibody uh, administrations we have done in this community. Over two years, um, what has surprised you about COVID-19? Are you, are you surprised that, that and, and I am, but I'm, I, again, I'm outside of the medical profession, that two years later, it is still so prominent in everyday life here in the United States? So, um, as you know, we're in a new, we're in a pandemic. Um, mm -hmm. The last pandemic was, uh, you know, 100 years ago, and now this is another pandemic. Uh, the pandemics usually behave like this. Uh, um, so the coronavirus causing COVID-19, you know, came 2019. Um, and then as we know, all the viruses, um, you know, keep mutating. Um, thus, uh, nothing uh, new uh, uh, is nothing strange. Uh, so, so when a virus mutates, in layman's terms, can you explain what exactly that means? What, how does that, why does that mutation take place or how does that mutation take place? And, and ultimately, is that good or bad? So the mutations uh, in viruses, including coronavirus causing COVID-19 pandemic, are neither new nor unexpected. The mutations of COVID has caused it to be more contagious as we have seen with how fast Omicron has been spreading. So, um, so in layman's terms, I know, the, and we'll, we'll probably piece some of this together. Why is Omicron spreading so much faster than the Delta variant? Again, the mutation, the change of the characters, uh, that's how the virus keep changing. Mm -hmm. One mutant, one variant more stronger than the other variant. That's how basically, um, you know, the, the change, the genes, genetics change. Do you think we'll see another variant? Yes, of course. Um, so, Mayor, as you know, an endemic disease is one that is not eradicated, uh, but slowly becomes less dangerous over time. The expectation that COVID-19 will become endemic essentially means that the pandemic will not end with the virus disappearing. Instead, the optimistic view is that enough people will gain immune protection from vaccination and from natural infection so that there will be less transmission and, and much less COVID-19 related hospitalization and death, even as the virus continues to circulate. The hope is that a less dangerous and disruptive strain of the virus will likely take hold and continue to be around much like the flu. So five years from now, we're probably gonna be, t when we take a flu shot, we'll probably be taking a coronavirus shot. Exactly, that's perfectly right. So it's here to, it, it, it's probably in America and, and really with the world, in our societies, it is here to stay. Right, right. 
So it may still be too early to tell whether this is what is going to happen, but we hope that is the case. That would only be the case if we don't get another variant that is stronger. Mm -hmm. The future will depend heavily on the type of immunity people acquire through infection or vaccination and how the virus evolves. So the more people that are vaccinated, the, and I, I assume even the more people who become infected, that then over time, the less dangerous it will become. Exactly. Unless there are pre-existing conditions or, or some com comorbidities that are that are that can you know that pose a danger. It, is that correct to somebody that doesn't understand or is not knowledgeable of the medical profession like you are? Exactly. So um, COVID is become becoming endemic. The pandemic stage will end by 2022. So endemic is that is the flu endemic? Is right. that a So the definition between the endemic and pandemic for example. An endemic disease is one that is not eradicated but slowly becomes less dangerous over time. Okay. So that essentially means that the pandemic will not end with the virus disappearing. Instead, the optimistic view is that enough people will gain immune protection from vaccination and from natural infection so that there will be less transmission and less COVID-19 related hospitalizations and death. The pandemic will completely don't go away, but that becomes an endemic. Mm -hmm. And then people react depending on their immune status depending by having a vaccination or natural infection or um, their, the variant, the mild variant or a more dangerous variant. If it's, for example, Omicron being a milder variant, if you are immunized, you are having a flu-like symptoms. Mm -hmm. If you're not immunized, you will have more than a flu-like symptoms. You have higher risks. They will, even though you're immunized, if you're at higher risk, you have more um, symptoms in the hospitalizations. What would you say to people that are worried about the the, the vaccine and the boosters for COVID nineteen? As as a physician, I know that you you've taken the vaccine and the boosters. Do you have any? I mean, what would you say to somebody that that is concerned about it that has yet to take it? So. Vaccine is essential part of our lives since childhood. As you know, every child gets vaccinated. Vaccines are not new. They have been there for years and years. As you see, a child from birth, they get different kinds of vaccines all the time. This is another kind of a vaccine. If we have not believed in vaccines. There will be polio now, there will be rabies now. There's so many diseases that they are all gone out of this mm -hmm. earth because we believed in vaccination, we took it, we eradicated them. So this is nothing, vaccination is nothing new. So I you know, recommend, especially being a pandemic, to protect themselves, to protect their family, to protect their community. You better do it. It's not only just for you, this is for the whole world. Mm -hmm. You have the responsibility to believe in the science and get vaccinated. This is not politics. Well, and I've, I've appreciated your honesty throughout the, the course of the past two years. And you've been very active on social media as well, which I know a lot of people appreciate. The fact is, is that COVID-19 was so scary because there was so much fear involved and it was new ground for all of us. I want to switch gears real quick before we close up. We're here at Crimson Village. Um, to me, part of your amazing story, because you represent the American dream, is not only are you, are you an outstanding physician, but you've created a great business here in Tuscaloosa, or businesses. And Crimson Village is an amazing place 
Tell people at home a little bit about Crimson Village and, and what led you to start it. So, as you know, I was uh, practicing primary care and urgent care practices in Tuscaloosa. So I have so much of a geriatric means older age population that I mm-hmm. uh, treat and take care of. So I can see there is a need of uh, a quality care. Uh, and also I was a medical director to one of the local assisted living. So I have seen uh, the type of uh, uh, the care, the type of uh, uh, the procedures. Uh, I thought I can uh, you know, do a better job and mm-hmm. provide the, that care for my community. The other important thing also took me to this is, as you know, my mom, who is the only parent I have, she lives in India. Uh, she don't live with me here. So I kind of look at the old people like my parents and see my parents in them. And I was not able to help my mom. Uh, I have a brother, younger brother, who's mm-hmm. taking care of her. She's fine there. But I wish I was there helping her, taking care of her too. But I thought I can have a better quality life for that age group by having a great team, great facilities, Mm -hmm. good amenities, and good food at the age, having the best chef in the town, and then um, having a lot of activities, uh, good activity directors, and having walking trails outside the physical health so that they can move and do well uh, in their life longer. Plus, have their brain more activated with a lot of games and church activities, Mm -hmm. a lot of activities for mind and brain, um, you know, brain and body kind of activity so I can give them a quality life. And then I can see a lot of families in this community appreciating me and thanking me. I, I hear all a lot the of positive things. Telling them that, you know, thank you for doing this. And uh, my mom, you know, is very happy or she is <laughs> more uh, active. Or, so, so many compliments. And I had a, I'm very blessed to have a great team that um, involved in this uh, uh, Crimson Village. And everybody have a passion to it. Somehow I was blessed in that aspect. Everybody put their heart into it. So this is not an easy task at that age group. People, you know, serving that mm-hmm. age group is not an easy, easy task. You need to have really a passion for it. And I'm really blessed uh, that a great team that doing a great job and we're moving forward. Well, it shows and you can feel yeah. the positive vibes and energy in here. Last question. What do you do for fun? Do you ever get a chance to relax? Uh, you're smiling. You didn't expect me to ask that question of you. but um, And by the way, he made me send him the list of questions because he wanted to make certain he got them right. And that's what you want in a doctor that wants to make certain they, they get it right. So I didn't put this down on what I was going to ask you, but what do you do for fun, Dr. P? Right. Um, I mean, I love working. Work is fun for me. Again, it may sound strange. No, it doesn't. I understand. I go to work in the morning. I, when I'm leaving work, the same energy, same laughter, same, I will be going out. Everybody asks me, how can you be like this? Why you were always this much energy? Because I love it. I love what I do. It's your happy place here. Happy place here. But again, to be more um, even a serious, um, of course, I got a great family. I go home, spend time with the kids. Um, you know, gym, pretty much yeah. go to gym, uh, exercise, travel a lot. I have so much friends all over the world. I go travel, you know, I got to Jamaica, Caribbean, or visit friends. And so those kind of stuff I do. Yeah, well, I was actually me. there in uh, Hawaii 10 days. I just came two days ago. You know what, when uh, I was texting you about an issue and you, you do such a great job and then somebody told me, you know he's on vacation. <laughs> I, it, it's amazing that you're, it always feels like you're on call and right. uh, you're, 
you're an amazing person who has an amazing life story, who's made an amazing difference in Tuscaloosa. And I really appreciate you joining us today. Uh, this is Dr. Ramesh Parmasetti. I can't tell you enough what I think about this man as a person, and this community appreciates everything you've done for it, especially in the last two years dealing with COVID. This is another edition of Tuscaloosa Talks. Thank you for joining us.